just to kind of preface some things. I'm, I try to make these things, this is the third time I've been here, so I try and make them build on top of one another. So if you really want a good foundation in lighting, exposure, color, and things, start at the first one. The second one is more location, event lighting. And now this third one is doing portraits, headshots, on location. Uh, the tool of choice that I always love to use are speed lights. And it's not that I don't use strobes, it's not that I don't use continuous light. Light is light. So I just like to use speed lights because everything I do is on location or destination and I could travel with more lights versus more light, to quote a friend of mine, uh, Stephen Eastwood, meaning I travel with at minimum five speed lights and I could do more with that versus if I had to come in here and the strobes I use are Profoto B1s, you know how much gear I would have to have five B1s with me, right? It's, it's a lot to lug around. So I don't have an assistant. I go on location with my production manager. It's been shipped all over the world. So I could hit the ground and all this stuff fits in my bag and I could create beautiful light anywhere. But again, it's the right tool for the right job. So if I'm shooting, uh, just did a wedding Saturday night and we had roughly two and a half hours of formal portraits. And we're gonna be doing this really quickly, exchanging people in and out, and big groups, small groups. So for that, it makes sense to use the strobes. You know, waiting for recycle time, boom, 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 can move quickly. Now I have done that with speed lights. You just have to change your pace, slow down, allow for the recycle time. But I never sacrifice quality of light. So it doesn't matter if you're using the small speed light in a large studio style modifier or a strobe. It's the quality of light that comes from it. So at lighting, I use lighting to convey mood, to um, get a thought across, to just illuminate at times when we're in dark environments. And then all the different lighting tools I use shape and bring that quality of light to the subject. So that's all we're really doing. So as photographers, we can't practice our craft without light. So going back to that, that was a big learning curve for me. When I was younger, photojournalist, you don't use flash, right? It ruins it, it's not good, it's ugly, on-camera flash is terrible. So this goes way, way, way back. So my mentor, John H. White, he would never use flash. So when we first started working together at the Chicago Sun-Times, we get sent out to cover this fire, and he's like, you go in close, you do this, that, and I'm gonna stay back here and I'm gonna get this overall. And it was at night. So he's thinking pictorially, he's from the background, the flames are coming out, silhouettes, he's using the light. Me, I think I'm gonna run up where the action is. So I run up, I'm right below the ladder and the firemen are handing people down and they're doing this stuff. And I was in the shadows and I'm cranking the film, film, Triax film, 3200 was like insanely high, don't go above that, right? Our lab techs. And I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting. And, you know, I got a couple usable frames, but nothing to write home about. And I said, never again will I be limited by the scene meaning, oh, don't use a flash. I would have had a lot more usable moments and images had I had a flash. And it's an option, that's all it is. So flash, continuous light, anything, it's all just light. So at that point in time, I said, I'm gonna learn to use flash. So this is kind of the long story how I've evolved my career. So back at the Sun-Times, we used to have uh, portable lighting kits you could take out but they were huge, no battery powered. It was a 60 pound case with two heads, couple umbrellas, and it was inconvenient to walk around to press conferences and things or corporate shoots or anything with those lights. So I started this with Vivitars. When you had to have an optical slave or a 20 foot PC sync cord, a little collapsible umbrella, and I started lighting things. Well, I started getting more assignments. Then I started freelancing and you start getting more assignments. And the reason is, is the better you light it, the better the reproduction is gonna be. And that's still true today. So many situations that I'm in to photograph that I get commissioned and hired to photograph are dark, low light. And you need that sparkle, that kiss of light. And these tools allow me to do that anywhere, anytime. So I never again am gonna fall victim to available light. So the cameras today will shoot in just about near darkness. 
Now again, you could shoot in any kind of light, but it doesn't mean the quality of light is great. So if I had to photograph you guys in the audience, sure, the camera could do it. I've got a 5D Mark IV, 1DX Mark II. It'll shoot at a gazillion ISO. I have 1.4 lenses, great. But the quality of light on you is not something that you would appreciate if you commissioned me or hired me to make a portrait of you, right? So thereby, lighting is empowering you. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna borrow and steal and be inspired by other people. So Irving Penn, was a great photographer, he used one light, and he started using a corner. So then, I've, I've done that before, in the studio, used V-flats. Westcott came out with this X-drop full-length backdrop. I thought, oh, that's cool, because now we could do a full-length body shot, because I do headshots, I do corporate work. And then um, another friend of mine, Joel, he decided to put two of them together and make a quarter on location. So I'm like, genius. So now I'm borrowing his idea as well. So you could set two of these guys up and you could get creative for portraits or headshots. So for me, I don't have a studio. I don't have a place that I'm shooting in because everything I do is on location. So let me just run through, say get an idea of what I do. And again, if you guys have any questions with anything, I'm here for you. So I want you guys to benefit from this. And I'm sure if you're thinking it, so is somebody in the audience. So this is all of 2016. So usually at the end of the year, which I'm not there yet, I did my last wedding last week, but I'm sticking to the tables. But I have you know, three more events, engagement shoots before the end of the year. So I like to put this together at the end of the year so you get an idea of where you've been, where you're going. And I always want to be green and growing. I don't fall into a rut with what lighting tool I'm going to use. I don't have a certain style that I stick with. My goal and my wife's goal, Dawn, we're partners together in our business, Bob and Dawn Davis Photography and Design, is to reflect the energy of the event and the people and their style in our work. Because that goes back to visual storytelling. Weddings, events, galas, corporate, portrait. I don't want to project my vision onto them. When I arrive somewhere, I let the venue, the event, the energy of the person speak to me. I'll have an idea, of course, and then I'll modify that to fit what I feel would best serve them. So it's not about I have to make this cool, edgy looking photo. It's about what are they going to appreciate? What are they going to take away? How can I serve them better? because I've been incredibly blessed to never work a day in my life. What I mean by that is I've pursued my passion and my career in photography since high school. So I've been blessed to do whatever I enjoy and it's taken me and my family around the world. And every time someone hires me, I still pinch myself. Are you kidding me? I get to play and have fun and people still appreciate what I do. So go for it, right? Another thing I want to share is if, if my wife Dawn and I can do this, so can you. One thing that's gotten me further in my career than anything else besides talent or knowledge is persistence. You just gotta keep on knocking on the door, keep on getting your work out there, keep on pushing yourself to be green and growing and move forward. So, another thing I want you to take away from just looking at this is the consistency of the quality that we strive for. Because I've worked for magazines, newspapers, I've always been edited. I have an editor that I have to serve. So your work, when you're being edited out of camera, needs to be technically proficient. Because the better you are, the less they have to do on the back end, the more they will hire you. So that goes back to my days as a photojournalist and working for Time Magazine. I would get the dog assignments, the terrible assignments, because I would like them. I would bring the same passion and energy to those as the big assignments, right? Even with our weddings and events, the details that go by, people are on an emotional journey. Everything about a wedding is emotional, from the fork, to the cuffling, to the flatware, the flowers, everything. So we light, compose, and attack those with the same passion as the large cinematic portfolio shot you can get from a wedding. And that separates us. You know, I don't just phone it in, oh, that's a detail shot. No, no. So it, it's part of our brand, it's part of our style. 
and using light, be it flash, continuous light, daylight, window light, it's all about how you see and use that light that could become your signature. So our images are more bright and airy, romantic, so to speak. And one of the comments that we get often from our clients, and I'll go through a few of these at a slower rate to show you and talk about some of the technical aspects, is that the images look 3D. And what I interpret from that is we work in a two-dimensional media, but to convey depth, you have to use light and shadow. Shadows are just as important as light. You know, uh, another friend of mine who has spoke, spoken here, uh, Charles Glatzer, you know, he says, uh, let me think, say it correctly, light illuminates, shadows define. And that's true, because if everything's just bright, brightly lit, you have no definition and the image can become flat. So the shadows are equally as important as the highlights, right? Let me get out of this. Any questions, thoughts so far? Pull up, and then we're gonna get into shooting live. Right. No, all good? Yeah? Okay, any questions from uh, Facebook? Are you guys gonna throw me questions if anything pops up? No? Got one? No. No, no questions, okay. Hard to see with the lights in the back. I'm afraid I'm gonna trip over a cable here. All right, so again, just speaking on details, and, and I'm just gonna go through these really quickly so we could get to actually shooting, photographing. So I draw inspiration, like I said, from the event. This bride, this is Marley's wedding, and the tones and her decor in her room were golds, blushes, creams. So this is a boring hotel room with beige textured wallpaper. <laughs> but anywhere could be a studio. Right? So I have a gold gel I put over a speed light. Every hotel has a glass tabletop on a nightstand, on a desk, on anything. You clean the dust bunnies off because my wife does all of our retouching and editing and it drives her crazy if she has to go in and spot out a million of them. So she's educated me, watch for flyaway hair, take care of the girls and you know any small details you could clean up before you take the image is better. Essentially, we're pre-touching the image instead of retouching, so it saves time. So one flash behind, and it's just bouncing. Actually, it's vignetting. You can see a little bit of a natural vignette, so it has a grid on it with a gold gel on the wall. Boom. Now we could adjust the flash output to whatever you want to create that look, and then it's one front light. So if you look up here, this is a Westcott strip light. It's a rapid box strip. It's small, it's compact. It sets up really easy, it travels well. Well, that's my main light. So we get beautiful quality of light. This looks like a commercial shot in the studio. Now I practice this, so it takes me, you know, five minutes to do a shot like this. You walk in with a vision, you clean it up, tidy things up, boom, shoot, move on to the next, right? But the lighting, if you wanted to do this available light, there is no windows in this room, and then it's all overhead lighting. You could make the edge disappear by just adjusting your angle. Just get up a little bit, shallower depth of field, you know, all the metadata is there. But again, it's just bringing that quality of light to everything we do. Now I practice and live this so I could get very proficient. I drive my family nuts. At home, I'm constantly practicing. I just got these deep umbrellas from Westcott earlier this year, so I ran around and practiced on my dog, on my wife, on my kids, in my living room before I took them out on a job. Because anything that goes in this bag that I bring on location has got to serve me. So multiple purposes. So I could use these for large formals. I can use these for really cool edgy portraits. Being a deep umbrella, we could focus and change the light. And we're gonna go through the benefits of that. Very cool. So this might look like just total available light, but it's not. This is using continuous light. Two ice lights. You could see the highlights in her eyes. I'm using for the makeup because I couldn't get a flash in there with the modifier I wanted. So I put the ice lights on either side 
of the makeup station reflecting back toward the bride with the barn door so I could confine the light and shape it. The ice light creates a beautiful soft light going forward. And because the environment was more tungsten lit, I used a tungsten gel over it. Yes, sir? What is the ice light? The ice light is kind of like a lightsaber from Star Wars. It's what, Dave, about three foot long? Two, two and a half feet long. LED. It's LED, but high quality LED. So you don't get any color shifting or flicker as you make it brighter or dimmer. And it's a vertical tube. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful quality of light. But again, it's a tool for a job. So I, I don't use the ice lights as my only light. And the reason being is because they're continuous light and we need to be in an environment where they'll give illumination. So they can't compete against bright sunlight. So again, that's why speed lights are my tool because I could use them in low light, bright light, any type of light to convey an image. But there are times where I want a different look. Like I said, I wanted this nice soft light on her. Just bouncing a flash with mirrors and the white tile was gonna send light everywhere in here. And I wanted to control it and I wanted to keep a softer look. No, I just propped them right against the mirror. I have tape with me, so you just roll a piece of duct tape backwards and pop them in, you see it, and you go. So this was just fun, right? I'm, I'm just playing around here. Um, mom walks in. Dig how sharp that is, though. Mom is checking out Marley's makeup, making sure the eyes look good, the eyelashes look good. But there's the ice light, there's mom, there's me right in the eye. I just thought that was cool, you know? Beautiful light just to show her eyes and the eyelashes, but then again, I was zooming in, I'm like, wow, is that cool? You could see mom, you could see me, very cool. In this environment, it's mostly tungsten lighting, very warm tones. So light, and, and in the previous videos, I show how I use live view, and I'll do that when we come up here really quickly, to find our dominant color in the environment we're in. So if you use live view and your camera's in daylight white balance preset, not auto white, because auto white's gonna try and balance everything, we could find out the dominant light in your space. In this instance, it's tungsten. So even though sometimes they're fluorescent lights, you hit live view and you see what your RGB, the red, green, and blue values are doing, you'll know is it more blue, meaning daylight, is it more warm, meaning tungsten. Or if your green channel is moving to the right, then it's fluorescent. So we could adjust accordingly. So I balance my lights to the light in the environment because I'm gonna use all the light in the environment that I'm in. So you could say I'm an available light photographer. I use all the light that's available to me, right? It's all there, so again, that's where I got over that big hurdle when I stopped thinking of flash as flash and just light. So when I walk into an environment, I think of all the light available to me and what could I do to bring quality to it. So here, I wanted something more dramatic in the moment. So we had a flash at the bottom of the light, at the bottom of the stairs, just direct going up to them to create a hard shadow. Now if I didn't, fill in those shadows a little bit with a light up here just bouncing in the environment, then the shadows would be very hard, very deep, very distinct. You know, so just by balancing the two, we get information in the shadow side and in here, so we don't have a very hard, deep shadow look. Now this gets like cooking. Everybody has their own flavor and own taste. There is no right way, there is no wrong way. It's a creative process. Everything that I share with you or any other presenter will share with you is just what works for them. Take their knowledge and experience and apply it to what you do and what will work for you. I like backlighting. I like it to be brighter than normal and some people are like, oh, your, your backlight's too bright. I'm like, well, that's your opinion. It's what I do. Color is a big deal. It can convey mood, it can convey anything. So this was at the wedding. I brought a piece of plexiglass. We had time. Again, I get to know my couples. Being a journalist, I kind of interview them. And she's into fashion. They were into portraits. Photography was important to them. They're like, have fun. We, want it. we have time. I want to do some concept portraits. Sure, why not? We'll try this. 
So you can see there's cross color going on here. I'm going to throw up a slide at the end of this to where you could download uh, a free guide from, from Dawn and I on how to do cross color lighting. So, and we're going to demonstrate it here live. So our main light is tungsten white balanced. So hence the flesh tones are nice. The second light, which was in the strip box, is daylight. But because I'm photographing in tungsten white balance preset, it's going to render blue. So you could use that to convey a mood, a feeling, a style, or a design. Right? Then it's all just matched. Again, just having fun with it. Mm -hmm. But these are all quick. I can't turn their day into a photo shoot. You know, you have to go there, you have to be ready, you have to be prepared, and you have to get it done quickly. This is going back to the ice light because it gives, um, flash to me is a great tool, but sometimes it's cold, it's snappy, it's sharp. And I don't know any other way to articulate it other than sometimes continuous light feels soft and romantic. Maybe I equate that to old black and white films and movies and Hollywood because those are all continuous light. Where flash, it's a great tool, but at times it's just very hard edged, snappy, really sharp, right? And I'm not referring to the sharpness of the lens. Um, this is a large room, an environment. And I spoke about this in my last presentation here about lighting in big event spaces using a technique I developed called the triangle of light. It's using three speed lights off camera with small light modifiers. And those light modifiers give a kiss of light to this environment which is candle lit, low lighting. I'm not trying to overpower the event space, but just add that highlight and sparkle to the eyes. So I'm blending my light with the light in the environment, right? Formals, this is where I was speaking of earlier. Again, we do a lot of formals for our families. They have big families, people coming together. You need to nail these. A lot of photographers, a lot of wedding photographers wanna work with us, wanna assist us, send me their portfolio. And these are terrible. They don't put the same energy and effort into these because it's boring, right? They don't wanna do it. They're not organized. Well. These are the photos that are going to be around when they retire or grandma passes away or something like that. They're going to be in the family photo album. They're going to be on the mantelpiece. They're just as important as the big cinematic moments. So light them. So these are two Profoto B1s using the deep umbrellas because we were there for a couple hours. But look at the nice rim light on the edge of people, right? They're separated from the dark paneling. And the way to do that is with a rim light. Again, two speed lights on either side in the strip box with the grid so I'm not flaring back into the lens and I'm controlling where that light is going, right? So it's adding light. Now, some people will ask, how do you control and mix Canon speed lights and pro photos? Well, you have to use one or the other in terms of your dominant language. So I'm using the pro photo transmitter to control the B1s, and then I'm using the air receiver just to fire the Canon speed lights with a PC sync cord. That's why it's all unified. I cannot control the off-camera light other than fire it. So you have to set the flash manually. It won't do TTL, it won't do high-speed sync or rear curtain sync, but they will all fire. And it's more reliable than putting an optical slave on your speed light because there's family members here shooting as well with their iPhones and their little flash would pop the light. You know, I want the lights to fire when I need them to fire. And you put an external battery pack on them and you could do these no problem. So as the group changes in size, you can just adjust your light accordingly. And again, using the deep umbrella, this has a different feel and look. It's using one deep umbrella and then the rim lights, see? The rim lights on either side. But what we do is we control the shape of the light by how we use the umbrella. Let me bring this out here really quick. So a deep umbrella, what's different about it from a regular umbrella is this parabolic nature and it's gonna shape the light. In fact, if you come up here and you speak into it, you could hear the sound changing and that's what it does with the light. So if I adjust this, the further out it goes, the larger the light source using this entire surface. So it will be less focused. You could say a, a softer light or more diffused light. The closer in I bring it, 
the more directional the light comes, it's going to confine it, making it a harder light source. So it's really versatile. This is a silver one, great for speed lights, but it also gives more specularity. I use the silver and the white. And I have the 53 inch models instead of the smaller ones because I'm going to light groups. And I want it to serve two purposes. And then, if I really want soft diffuse light, we have a diffusion sheet to cover this entire thing. Now it's a 53 inch octabox. Beautiful soft light. And we're going to shoot live so you can actually see the quality of light and what it does in shaping. And the difference between silver and white. If I'm, so Logan is our model. I'm, I'm not going to photograph yet. But she's fair complected. I don't need to use a hard specular surface on her. So I'll use the white umbrella. And then when we combine the white umbrella with the diffusion, the light's going to be gorgeous, right? Guys, tuxedos, you know, things like that, a lot of darkness. You can use the harder edge of the shape by pushing the umbrella further in toward the flash head, and then the specularity of the silver. And then it's more efficient with speed light as well. All right. Nice big event. This one is a camera on an interval timer, so I don't have to be up in the loft making a photograph. But right here is a light stand with three speed lights. Right here is a light stand with three speed lights. Then there's one in the loft where I'm at. So when we're photographing down in the environment, we're using the flashes. So we have three photographers covering the, this event, myself and two others, because it was a big event. Everybody has to have their own set of lights. And they're on one light stand, so we don't overpopulate the environment with light stands. And then we're using the triple threat. So Westcott makes a device called the triple threat. So you could have three different groups of speed lights or three speed lights to act as one to get more power out of the umbrella. Really useful tool. So again, everything I have serves me well on location. So this is the look during the ceremony with flash. That's not my guy. I would never just stand up there. That's the videographer. I would never leave a camera in the aisle. Drives me nuts. We have to retouch those out for the book. What you can't, well, you could almost see it. Let me zoom in. Is again, my background is in photojournalism, sports, everything. This right here, if you look really, oh wait, I could zoom further, is a remote camera. I usually do two or three remote cameras at a wedding. It's now become my hoopa cam. Let me get the zoom. So if we go in, burp. See the antenna? And then I work with the design team to camouflage it as best as possible. So it's a 5D Mark IV, which was pretty quiet with a 24 millimeter lens. And then it will fire whenever I photograph from my camera because I have it plugged in so that when I shoot, it shoots. Right, so it's a really handy tool to have. So again, I get a different perspective, which you're gonna see. Again, the details look amazing. You could create direction with lighting. You put your lights in different groups, different flash outputs. Your options are endless to what you could do with the triangle of light. I'm not a victim of available light. Now, when we photograph, I don't fall into a rut. So in an environment like this, to best serve our client, I'll take some with flash, some bright, some dim, some total available light. We get published an awful lot in wedding magazines because they look at this and they think reproduction. Wow, look at the details in here and the sparkle. That's all flash. But it's not overpowering the scene. And we get published an awful lot. Where if I just provided an available light shot, the shadows would be so heavy and dark, they would mud up and block up, especially for reproduction. Even with our books, they would block up. Right? So you could kind of see, here's the technical loft where the remote camera is from the back end. That's not my light. I would never leave a light on the floor. It's a hazard. But video, they leave a camera on a tripod, they leave a light there, right? My light is about 75, 80 feet back there in the loft. Small light. Now you might say, why not use umbrellas in here? Well, if we use a big umbrella, that's a big, bright thing going off in a candlelit situation, which would be distracting, and mom and dad would have my hide, right? Because all of a sudden, it's a woof of light. 
And we don't want to detract from the environment. But you could see all the directionality. Now, no on-camera flash here, just a light left, a light right, and a light behind them. And because it's all wireless, radio controlled with the Canon speedlight system, I can adjust the power. I could trade between manual, TTL, main light, fill light. It's infinitely adjustable. So here you can see the shadows coming forward. So where's the main light? Correct. Yes? So are those three speed lights, are they bare heads or are they modified? The three speed lights are not bare heads. They have a magma diffusion dome on it, a diffusion spear, because that way the light doesn't have to be perfectly aimed at the center of the room. The spear, as soon as it grabs light, it diffuses it and sends it out to the sides. And, we're not, and again, it's just to give accent. It's not to overpower. And I couldn't use, I, you could use an umbrella, but again, trying to light a large space like that with a reflective umbrella would be near impossible without strobes, and it would be detracting. So right tools for the right job at different environments. You know, most of the details and things like that, I use the strip lights or bare flash with a gel. Then when we go to portraits, creative, formal, all those sets of things, umbrellas, larger light modifiers, or soft boxes. Then once we get here, we want to pare down really small so we don't have a large presence with our lighting in the environment. But just because you're doing that doesn't mean you can't bring illumination. This room is big. It's about, um, what is it? It's two stories tall. It's about 80 feet in length, uh, width, and about 100, 120 feet in length. Look at 2,000 ISO, 1 25th of a second at 3.5. I never really go above aperture 5 in this setting, so my lights don't have to work that hard. So this is an important fact, which I share all the time. Write it down, understand it, is the holy trinity of exposure is ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. And they're all reciprocal of one another. What you do to one affects the other. So my approach to anything I photograph is I set the ISO first. The ISO determines how sensitive the camera is to light, right? OK, so I want to pick up ambient light. My lighting is not equal to an ambient light, because then it would be flat. We want to create depth and dimension. This photograph to me has depth. It has dimension. It has light. It has shadow. So I underexpose the ambient light by about a stop and a half to two stops. I pick my aperture after I pick ISO, because that's how hard the speed lights are going to have to work. It's a little speed light. It could do a lot once you understand what its limitations are, what it will do. So by picking 2,000th of a second, 2,000 ISO, that gets me to a shutter speed that I'm comfortable hand-holding. My aperture is 3.5. That's the light output my flashes, the speed lights, have to give me. Now shutter speed, because I'm in manual mode, adjusts how much ambient light is affecting the scene. Slower shutter speed, more ambient light. Faster shutter speed, less ambient light. So you arrive at that sweet spot for a look that you like so you can create depth and dimension. right? And I approach everything I photograph that way, whether it's inside, outside, or not. Yes, ma'am? So I see your shadows are falling. Yes. Down. However, there seems to be quite a lot of brightness on the bottom half of her dress. What light is that? So you guys are the band, right? That's the whole room. There's a speed light at the, at the edge of the band on each side. So those lights are illuminating the edge on her. Now, we are picking up some of the video light, for sure, at 2,000 ISO at 1 25th of a second. So that's kicking a lot more light. You can see, and of course, a white dress picks up more light, but it's brighter on this side. More of that's coming from his video light as well. And I also make sure that their lights are tungsten. A lot of videographers just show up with a light and they don't know what it's doing. If this is a couture dress, it's not off the rack. And if that light was daylight and I'm balanced for the environment of tungsten, remember that first portrait where it was blue cast? This is not a time to be creative in throwing a blue cast on her beautiful dress, right? So I do carry extra gel with me, or now their lights, they can actually dial in the color temperature. So we'll talk ahead of time. We'll play nice together. 
at least these, these video guys, they are great. They do a great job, and at least they light. They're at a different limitation than I am with a light panel because it's not directional. It will not carry. They're just trying to provide illumination. I'm actually trying to convey a mood and shape. Yes? Are you shooting TTL? Yes. <laughs> Question, am I shooting TTL? Yes and no. Because the system will do whatever I want it to do, if I'm photographing towards a light, and if I move a little bit left, a little bit light, right, and I catch too much of that speed light in TTL, the camera and the flash are going to communicate and say, too bright, too bright, and it's going to quench the flash output of all my lights. So in order to avoid that for consistency, that backlight, half power manual at that distance. These lights are TTL, but then I could adjust them through exposure compensation on each individual light, up or down. Well, because we want them even on the sides, they're both probably like minus two in flash exposure compensation. So it gives you choices and options. Just dragging the shutter, I wish that the Canon Speedlight system would allow you to do true off-camera rear curtain sync. The Pro Photo system does. So what we do with rear curtain sync, this almost achieves it, is you're shooting, photographing at a slow shutter speed to convey motion. I want the couple, when they look at this image, yeah, I can hear the music, I'm dancing, I can feel it. It puts them back in that moment versus just a frozen shot. And again, I do both. So you can see my flash is firing. It's in manual mode. So it does not quench the system. The on camera, because I'm literally this close with the 16 to 35, is in TTL for fill. And the other two off cameras are in manual as well. So I'm just shooting at a slow shutter speed and turning the camera. And the reason I turn instead of panning is because this is not true rear curtain sync. So the way sync works really quickly is normal sync is capping, let's call it a 250th of a second, where a camera and a flash sync up. What that means is as the flash fires, it can properly illuminate the entire image, top to bottom. These are focal plane shutters, so it opens up in a sliver and it goes across and closes. You go above 250th of a second, speed lights just won't work. They keep the shutter speed at 250th of a second. But if it's a strobe, you'll start getting a black bar. That's because the shutter is traveling faster than the flash could illuminate. High speed sync is the flash is actually pulsating multiple flashes to keep up with how fast the shutter speed is going. Rear curtain sync is the opposite. You expose, you expose, you expose, the flash fires at the conclusion of exposure. So if you're panning, you get a nice, solid, frozen image of your subject without streaks going across them. They go away from them. But in dragging the shutter, it's still gonna fire on the first curtain. So that's why I'm twisting, not panning. So as I twist the camera, the streaks don't go across the subject. There's my highlights. Flash fired in the beginning, and this is just burning in with a longer exposure. So it gives you a creative option. But again, it's just understanding and knowing your tools. To me, this feels very natural and wonderful. You couldn't get this look with one on-camera director bounce or no flash at all. A lot of photographers photograph in the Standard Club at Chicago, available light. They rely on the videographer to have his light to throw something in here. Here, I'm in total control. And it's not just flooding the room or him with light. It's actually kind of thinking, how do I want it to look? Dad, best man, groom. Groom is his uh, best man is his brother. You want to convey some type of portrait of those three people and their relationship. So how many lights are in this? Anybody? Three. Three what? Three, three flashes? Three flashes? Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good guess. It's actually two flashes, but it is three lights. Again, I think of all the light in the environment, our available light counts as a light. So I'm gonna first use live view, see how much available light I want in the image. Live view's great instead of taking a test shot. And I do this with my assistant before they ever come over. I get this all vision in my mind, all set up, and I go over to them and say, hey, can I have five minutes of your time? We come over, boom. 
and then I go back to the party. I have a light in the back with a snoot, so we're just highlighting them. And the light in the front has a Fresnel lens. See how circular it is? We're not filling up the entire space, and that's a mirror. I gotta really watch where that light is so it does not project into the mirror. You know, so that's using this thing called a mag beam, which is a Fresnel lens. So it, boom, it really confines and keeps the light right there, right? So all these things do is fulfill the vision in my imagination for the shot. You know, and they absolutely love it. And, you know, the, the image to me is black and white. Little end of the night shot, and we're gonna do a portrait like this here. So the background, you start getting these cool little shapes from the candles and the twinkle lights there. So I thought, well, why don't we add some in the foreground? So you dangle these guys in front of the lens to bring a little design element in, right? And that's our end of the night shot, you know? So it tells a full story. So if anybody wants to dive further. Don't worry about taking perfect notes for this next shooting technique, but text Shutterfest PDF to this number and you'll get the guide, which is going to go through all the settings, lighting diagrams, everything with what I'm about to share. So you can actually be present and take in what we're going to do. Ah, there we go. It's charging. Did I kick the wire out? I'm tripping all over back here. All right, so we're gonna photograph live. So we have our background, which we created this corner, and now we gotta think about what do we wanna say? What do we wanna do with the portrait? So throw out, you guys are my lighting directors, or my art director, let's throw out a challenge. I already know what I could do. What do you wanna see? What's that? Could you please go back to the text? Could I go back to the text? Oh, sure. Sure. There we go. Just want to make sure I stay on time. Yeah, good. All right. So do you have any requests, challenges? Sure. Because? Fine art portrait um, conveying sadness. Fine art portrait? Conveying sadness. Conveying what? Sadness. Sadness. Logan, that's you. I could light really sad, but now you got to bring that, right? Okay. All right. Um, why don't you pull up the chair? We'll start with that. And maybe I can share with you what I vision is better than I could articulate it. So maybe just something, you know, not, not down, but just forlorn, sad, right? All right, we'll, we'll start with that. She could bring it. So when you say that, I'm thinking mood immediately. So it's got to be, to me, a directional light and a harder light instead of something big and soft and pretty and bright. So the silver is what I would go to for that, right? I'm going to block the TV a little bit here. And we're going to make the light edgier, meaning we're going to get it off to the side so it's an edgier light. And I'm going to pull the umbrella shaft all the way in so that we can focus the light. Follow me? So we're going to make it a harder light and a smaller light. We're actually making the light a smaller light source. All right, so it's coming right in. So the sweet spot with this the hot spot, sweet spot, whatever you like to call it, is right where the umbrella shaft is, because that's going to be the center of light, the way the umbrella shape shapes the light. So I want to get that to kind of point right towards her nose. There we go. I'm going to turn the light on. So this is in group A. Is anybody familiar with the Canon Speedlight system? No, no. So it's, it's wireless, so it's radio controlled. It gives you five different groups, A through E, plus you have your camera flat, on-camera flash. There is nothing that's designated a master, meaning a group called master. So if this light is A, your on-camera flash is always the master, which is always in group A. You can't change that. 
So oftentimes photographers get confused by that because they're like, oh, this is A, and I turn A off, it turned that off, or I powered A brighter, why am I getting no separation? Well, that's because if this is in A, you need to make this one in B. So I'm gonna stay light and small. So I'm gonna use, let me see, I'm gonna grab uh, an 85. I have the new 8514, I just got it yesterday. Really excited. Okay, so we're gonna turn it on, let it catch up with Cam Ranger so we could send the photos wirelessly live. And I'm just gonna pick an ISO, right? We don't need to be relatively high. They are small speed lights. I want them to recycle quickly. So I'm gonna start off at 320. So the camera's up, Cam Ranger is on. I'm gonna reconnect it. Make sure I've chosen my network. Yep, it's there. There we go. So now the camera's connected. Okay, so here we could go to live view. So just to see what our ambient light is, I'm gonna choose daylight white balance preset. And we're gonna see what the ambient light is doing. So I could come over here and let you see the live view as well. So this is the histogram. That's the same information you're gonna see in post-production in any of your image editing software. So that does not lie. The LCD screen is just an indicator that you've captured the image and it's in focus. It's not a good judge of exposure or color. Okay, oh there we are. So it's really dark. There's still some ambient light in the shot that's affecting it, especially if I go, let me um, go wide open. So we're gonna come over here and we're gonna change the aperture to 1.4. Boom, we get a lot more light, right? So let me kind of steady up. Oh, cool, right? So you can see we're getting light. But that, again, is not good light or it won't convey sadness. Okay, so I don't want any ambient light. So we're gonna start off one of two ways. Does anybody remember what I said in the beginning? ISO is how sensitive the camera is to light. If I want to photograph at 1.4, one, one well, what am I going to have to do? Drop, your ISO. Drop my ISO, correct? Because we don't want light pollution ruining our shot from the lights that's in here. So I'm going to go lower in my ISO. I'm going to go to 100, and I'm going to start off at aperture 4, because I like eyes to nose and focus, right? for this particular image. I'm gonna take my shutter speed to 200. The 5D Mark IV sinks at a maximum of 200. So we're gonna go there. So now we're not gonna have any ambient light. And I'm gonna set my color balance to Kelvin. I pretty much live in Kelvin for white balance because Kelvin is the precise color temperature and I can adjust my color to my liking according to the histogram directly. So presets are exactly that. Daylight preset, I think, is 56, 5200 degrees Kelvin. Shade is, I think, 6500. Tungsten is 3200. But if I want to adjust the color of my image in camera, I can really fine tune it with Kelvin, precisely. So she's fair complected. I'm going to keep this image a little cooler because warmth is more romantic to convey mood for sadness, bluer for color. So I'm just gonna to go to my Kelvin color temperature and I'm gonna start off, let's start off at 4,500. That's below daylight. So our speed lights, our flashes, are daylight white balanced. All right, so the image is gonna be cooler. I'm gonna use a speed light transmitter because I like to be light and small, okay? So I put the speed light transmitter on, and this controls all five groups. Group A, that's my main light. So I, I have to think literally, so my main light is gonna be in group A. 100, aperture four, 200th of a second, it's in TTL. Okay, the only light that's gonna fire is the main light. We have a hair light back here and that's in group B, but we're not gonna use that. Not yet. All right, so let's see. 
So can you just kind of glance toward that light a little, there you go, a little bit sad, but yeah, bring your eyes to the light, there you go. All right, okay. So I think for it to be a little bit sadder, we can go black and white, right? Exposure's right on for me. Now the way I would judge this, again, is not by the image, but by this information. So see, it's blue. The channel going to the right tells you you have the most color. So if it's green, your image is going to be green. If it's warm tone, it's going to be red. Since it's cool, it is blue. OK? All right. Yes? Could I? Yeah. It'll get even bluer. Yeah. So we'll go 26. All right. And let's turn your face all the way that way. Looking right directly toward the light. A little bit more, there we go. So if I push the depth of field preview button on the camera, we're gonna get a modeling light. And I can see where that light is. There we go, nice. All right, so now I put the focus mark right on her eye. And we make an exposure. Very blue, really blue. Lots of blue. This gives you great control in camera to bring up an image, right? Now here's where I could decide, do I want to be manual for frame to frame consistency? Because if I change the composition, I get more black in the frame. And again, maybe just look right toward the light in a larger environment. Well, our exposure is going to change the white value, right? it's going to change a little bit. If we want frame to frame consistency on the back end, if you're doing portraits, you might want to think about going manual so the light output does not change. The way TTL works is it emits a pre-flash, reflects off the subject, light goes through the lens, and the camera says either more light or less light for flash output. So I'm going to stay in TTL for now, and I'm just going to lower the flash output. So I go to flash exposure compensation and we'll take it down minus one and a third. So it's even going to be less light. So just straight profile looking into there. And again, I put the focus mark. I do not focus and recompose into the subject. So now we're getting into a low key moody light, which we can control all from camera, right? I think this would look fabulous in black and white. So I just go to my white balance preset. I'm sorry, my picture style preset. And I'm going to dial in my black and white recipe. I'm going to do one more. And this time, if you don't mind, I'm just going to get your hands in it. So bring your hands kind of up your, and close your thumb and finger. And let me just fix your hair really quick. Yeah. Good. And straight profile into the light. There you go. Eyes down a little bit. Turn your chin a little bit more toward the back wall, please. There you go. Thank you, Logan. Very cool. Right? I even like the way the folds are catching. You know, very moody, very cool. Right? Very cool. Now, if I want it brighter, I could just go to flash exposure compensation again. And we're going to go plus one. OK? And I'm going to do something to really hone in on the light. I'm going to use flash, exposure, lock. You have a question? Do you shoot in uh, just JPEG or raw? I shoot raw, but we're sending the files remotely, so it's easier to send a small JPEG wirelessly to view. So it's writing a small JPEG to the SD card and a full raw file to the CF card. I'm going to use flash, exposure, lock, which uses the center focus point always in the camera. And I'm going to meter off of Logan's face. So Logan, if you'll look toward the light. There we go. See that pop of light? Now I have 16 seconds. It's going to hold that exposure. And again, look toward the light. Focus. Cool. So it properly exposed her face. Because I told it, take the flash meter reading right off her face. Pretty cool. Right. So now we can change it up. All right, so we're going to still stick with one light for a second. I'm going to go back to color. I'm going to zero out my settings. And now we're going to bring the group 
E on as well. And I'm going to turn off A. A is the main. I want to see what the hair light is doing. OK. Now this one, you could sit up nice and straight and cool. Good. We're going to see what that is. And you could kind of squint your eyes and hit depth of field preview. And it's just cresting the top of her head. And we have a grid on that, so we can control exactly where that light is going. And I'm going to take a photograph. And I'm going to put that one in manual mode because I'm shooting towards the light. And if I catch a little bit too much of it, depending on my composition, it's going to change its output if it's in TTL relative to my composition. And I want it to be consistent. So we're just going for a hair light now. See where we're at. Right? Barely see the top of her head. All right. I'm going to change my color balance back to daylight. So I'll take my Kelvin from 2600 to 58. It's going to be my starting point. And I think we need more light. But let's see. I want to try, try 1.4. And I'm going to focus just on her eye. Again, I'm focusing on her eye and not recomposing. OK, 1.4, we have a nice hair light. The red channel is not blowing out. This is a warm tone. The highlights are not blowing out. So I'm, I'm happy. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if the flash output, we're going to put it in TTL. Go to E group and just switch it to TTL. So what's going to happen in TTL is for whatever aperture value I have, 1.4, and the given exposure, it's going to try and properly expose everything. Sometimes it nails it in a backlight. Sometimes it's really bright. It depends on how much of the dark tones are in the metering pattern. All right, so I'm just going to, again, finding my hair light and just put that focus mark right on her eye. Focus. Boom. All right, now look what it's doing. It's not as controlled because it's trying to illuminate everything at that value. In fact, we have a lot more light on her face because the light is also bouncing off of the inside of the silver, reflecting back. OK? So I mean, you could get really, here, just a to, just to share, right? So if we want to get a little bit, pretend you have a reflector. You're like, oh, we could do that. So I could put this right there really quick. And then we could say, OK, I'm going to come in. Relatively same composition. Boom. And we get a totally different look and feel just by bouncing some light back in. Now, that's not a proper reflector, but you could see how you could start doing things that way. Yes? But when you felt there wasn't enough light after the initial shot, you reduced your aperture. Why not increase your ISO? I did two point? things. I did two things. I changed my aperture because I wanted less depth of field, and then I changed the flash output. So these are sticky, meaning they're going to stay where I left them. So I go back to manual mode on E, and it's at a 16th power at 100 ISO at 1.4. So now you'll see the hair light goes back to where I had it. Okay, Not too bright, not trying to illuminate everything. Right, Nice fall off. Now we'll do big light source. We're going to put the umbrella shaft further away. So we're increasing the size of the light source relative to the subject, right? Nice large light source. And I've set my flash head, the zoom, the Fresnel lens, manually to 20 millimeters. The reason I did that is I want to fill this entire umbrella with light. Follow me? So we're sending a shape of light into the umbrella. And you could also shape it that way from 20 to 200. So if you did 200, it's only utilizing a small space in the umbrella. We want to create a large light source now. So I'm going to use the diffusion. So see how versatile this tool can be for in your studio, location. And you can use continuous light. You could use strobe, whatever you want to put in it. It's just a tool to shape the light. I'm going to do this really quick and make
take a shot. There we go. All right. Now, can I ask you to move right out to the edge? Do you want the chair? Yes, please. We're going to bring the light in close. And again, remember the sweet spot. It's going to be the brightest. is right about where the shaft is. So I'm going to put that right by her face in alignment. It's still a little bit far to the edge for feminine lighting, but we're going to keep it interesting. Now, I'm going to go back. I'm seeing this in black and white in my imagination. So get to my black and white preset. Now she came out a little bit. I could, in theory, raise the hair light maybe a third of a stop, but we're going to see what happens. And I'm using 1.4. All right, there you go. And now I'm gonna select the single focus point mark that I can use and put it right on her eye because it's 1.4. Beautiful. So the A light needs to get turned back on. So the hair light is still looking good. That's just the hair light, right? We're not spiking anything up. The highlights look good. The RGB values are dead on equal. So there's no color shift, even if this was color. So now we're going to bring the A light on. It's in TTL. Flash exposure compensation is neutral. A is completely neutral. There we go. Let's see. I'm going to put you way off to the edge. Good. Good, good, good. Now, the front light is TTL. It's large, soft, diffused light source. So this is no longer directional. Look how much of the background we're illuminating. Because now we are filling this entire space with light. We have a nice hair light for separation from the background. And I'll turn it off in a second. But what I really like is the shadow side of her face is filled. You don't even need a reflector because it's such a large light source. Now, as we move this straight back, not changing its angle, we're gonna move it a greater distance away. In theory, the shadow side of her face should get darker. So I'm gonna take one frame, no flash, just to make sure we're not getting any light pollution. Oh, we are. So at 200th of a second, 1.4, 100 ISO, we're still getting information. Normally, we'd have to change. I can't go any lower on the ISO. I can't, I don't want to close down the lens. I want to stay at 1.4. What should I do? I want to eliminate the ambient light. So what do I do? So if I can't go above 200. I can't go below 100. Oh, your aperture. Your aperture. I don't want to change it. Can you make it Bring the light so small? No. No. We're going to go high speed sync. High speed sync. Yep, exactly. So I'm going to turn the transmitter on, set the sync to high speed. So now let's go to 500th of a second, see if we cut down the ambient light. So this is the same approach I use if it's daylight. Oh, I turned the flashes on, sorry. And I could see in my meter inside the camera, it's pretty nil. There's not much. Still a little bit, not much. So okay, let's kill it completely. Let's go to 1,000. We don't want any, one, any ambient light, but I want to photograph at 1.4. Boom. That's it. Oh, still a little bit. I don't want any. So where should I go? 2,000, no. I think uh, 1,600 should be good. Okay, we are good. Good deal, done. Still a little bit. Still there. Ah, there is, but we'll overpower that. All right, so let's turn the lights on. So TTL manual, 1,600, 1.4. All right, now let's see what we're gonna get. Nice. So we did. We d added darker shadows there. Come on. I should make it a smaller JPEG. There's a lot of wireless traffic in here. But see how much darker the shadow side of her face got? How richer 
and darker and deeper this is, all we did was move the larger light source further away. And it's a softer light than silver. So I'm just going to raise it up a little bit because I don't care for the shadow going upward. For me, I enjoy photographs that feel more natural, like window light. We're used to seeing light top down. Okay? So the further away your light, the softer the light is? Not really. The closer it is, the larger it is to the subject, the softer it will always be. And the shadows will be softer around because it's so large to your subject. It wraps it around. The further away it is, it's like the sun. Now this is getting smaller in relation to our subject. The shadows are going to get deeper. Okay? Fall. Yes, the fall off. That's the law of reciprocity. Right? So we're actually going to raise it up. There we go. I'm going to angle it downward a little bit. And I'm going to feather it even a little bit more to use more of this side instead of the full light because I want a little bit more mood for the corner. Okay, Let's do that. See what happens. All right. And it's still just two lights. Ah, very nice. Very kind of moody and classic and beautiful. So, okay, now we're going to pose it a little bit. So, Logan, drop your chin just a little and turn it slightly this way. There you go. And eyes to me. And I'm going to focus on the eye that's closest to the lens. Because at 1.4, there's a big difference. Look at that. That's pretty badass, huh? Right? Beautiful. So let's just see if I'm taking my time. Looks like it. Yep, everything is sharp. Beautiful. Nice exposure. Everything's good, right? All right. Now we could fill in on this side, either with a reflector or another light. Question you had? Is that histogram where you want it? For this mood, yes. Yes. If we want her face brighter, we're also going to brighten the background. Because it, again, the size of the light source. Unless. We bring in another light. All right? So let's try this. We're going to bring in a direct flash. Nice, hard light. So we're going to put this in group B. Let's see where you're looking. So you're going to turn your chin a little toward me. There you go. OK. And now we have to shape that light. So let's first, since we're talking about light shaping, use a grid, right? A grid is going to confine the light and shape it. And let's see what it's going to do. OK. I'm going to eyeball it. Cool. We'll turn everything off so we know what that one light is doing because it's not continuous light. So we don't see what's going on. Turn off the E light and the A light. And this is the B light. Make sure I have it in the proper group. We put it in B, and we're going to put it in TTL. Zero, meaning no exposure compensation. So the grid, the grid is in TTL? Yes. And we're going to go back to aperture four, two hundredth of a second, because we don't need high speed sync. Or, here, I'll take it. Sorry, one second. I'm going to go, just, just to be safe, we're going to go 640. Now, I could hit the depth of field preview. Yeah, it went off, but I didn't even see it. Yeah, it's there. So I don't think I'm aimed properly, because I didn't see the light in her face. Oh, we didn't communicate. There we go. B, B. Got my indicator. I'm just finding where this light is. There we go. I could see the nice shadow. All right, so that's illuminating her face. We'll wait and see what the histogram says. I'm actually going to change this to small, small JPEG just for convenience. Let's 
that's an S1. We're going to change it to S3. I'm sorry? It's just a JPEG. Yeah. Yeah. For convenience to send it. OK, so it is illuminating her face, right? But it's a different quality of light. All right, so we are going to bring, actually, I'm going to take it to manual mode because I actually want these two lights to work together. And you'll see why for a second. So I'm going to choose manual. So you just made both those lights same? No, they're in two different groups so that I could actually control the flash output. Yeah, but they are, the flash output, is they the same or no? They're in different groups because we're going to have this one in TTL where it was, and this is going to be manual. And what I want to do is just highlight her face and the highlights in her eyes to bring specularity without overdoing it. And this, we're going to ask for a lot of control, right? So it's still, you'd think a grid wouldn't take that much light away. So I'm at an eighth power, so it is. So we're going to go up to, bring it up just a little bit and see where we're at. And just want to dial in that light. Now you could use a flash meter to do all this as well. You cannot meter anything that is in TTL, right? Because it's a pre-flash, then the camera and the flash communicate for proper flash output. You can meter manual. Now it's just like a studio. All right, it's a little, little, little hot for me. So I'm going to drop it slightly. And now we're going to bring A on. And we're going to bring E on. All right, we are set to go. Just kind of turn your chin a little bit and eyes to me, coming a little closer. Beautiful, beautiful. So that affected the overall look of everything now, right? Nice, bright face too bright on A for me, for what I was going for. Let's, let's go back a couple images because I really liked the feel of this, OK? I like the feel of that. But we just introduced a manual light, so that's OK. And now we're having this one in TTL. And it's trying to read everything to give me the aperture value I'm going for. So instead of chasing my tail trying to dial in TTL, Let's put this in manual mode. It's a portrait. I'm not moving. She's not moving. The lights aren't moving. Whenever I do portraits for anything, I generally do all manual. When I'm in live event, live action, things are moving, things are changing rapidly, then I'm TTL, unless I'm shooting into a backlight. Then that light is in manual, but everything else is TTL. right? So we're in a portrait, so we're going to do it. There we go. Boom. Now, I told the light what to do. Instead of reading the background, reading the exposure, that's lovely. Yeah, sorry, standing in front of you. That's lovely. OK, that's a grid. What if we change the grid? This is going to give a different quality of light. What is that called? That's a Fresnel lens. So this is actually called a mag beam. Use it for wildlife, use it for um, throwing light at a distance, or use it like an old Hollywood light. So we're going to turn A off, and we're going to leave E on and see what B is doing, see the difference. And we could just, now another thing, because this is a Fresnel lens, it's going to magnify the light. So I'm not going to change the power output yet, but I know that I should lower the power output. right? So let's see what that looks like. And i got to readjust the angle of the light. See how much more precise it is as well? And that's all I want to do is light her eyes, where the grid was lighting all of this, too. right? I just want to draw your attention to her eyes. So I want to shape the light by doing that. So I love that first overall image is what we're building off of with this. Okay. So I need to go up a little bit. or we could collapse this, right? But if I collapse this, what's going to happen in my, yes. We're going to get a broader light source, and we're going to light the background more. And I don't want to do that, right? So that's why I have it fully extended. So let's try depth of field preview. Oh, that looks pretty cool. And then turn your chin slightly. And the reason I'm asking her to turn her chin slightly is I'm lighting from the side. And I do not want an extreme shadow on this side of her face, 
right? Now I could adjust the lights, but everything's in place for this, and you know, I'm limited time, and oftentimes I'm limited in my time with a subject. Still too bright, okay. So we're gonna take that down. Because I just want the highlights in her eyes. All right, pretty good. It's still very bright. Watch the histogram. See, it's still, oh, it's still touching the right side. I want a little bit less. But the eyes are just jumping right off. OK. Just going to do a third of a stop less. So that's a 64th power. So I'm just doing a third below. Now, we're going to bring A on. So now A, E, and B. Everything's on, three lights. Beautiful. All right, nice, nice smile. There you go, chin down just slightly, Logan. Nice, there you go, good. Oh, that's beautiful, right? Now, we could go back several. Where is it? I'm getting lost. Is it this one? I'm gonna do it in color to that feel. I still like that. I do. So I could just lower B as much as possible and see where we're at. Good. Beautiful. Now that's much better. I just dropped this so it's not as hard, right? So now we can be photographing and we just can decide, oh, okay, let's just turn B off really quickly. Let's just do something this way. Beautiful. Nice. Okay, that's cool, right? Softer look. Oh, quickly, I want to raise up A. So if we're working in manual mode, and I don't want to dial into each group to raise it to make it brighter, I could quickly just change my ISO. All right, so I'll go from 100 to 200. That's going to make it one stop brighter. Boom. Sweet. Right? Now you're just playing with the look and feel of everything you like. Okay, let's just bring the a, uh, B light back in for a second and see what it's doing. Nice, cool. Now we could say, okay, let's turn off A and just do a portrait that way. There you go, depth field preview looks great. Nice, right? So you could do Boom, 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 boom. Oh, the client wants to see it in color. Okay. Change your picture style. Because I'm also shooting raw, I still have all the color information. So if you shoot it in black and white, when you down, upload it to your computer, it'll be in color? The JPEG preview you see will still be black and white until you decide to render it. So if you're using Canon DPP, then you could choose a different picture style. If you're using Lightroom, then the minute you click on the image, it will do the raw decode and it will appear in color. So this time, extreme, give me a profile toward the light. There you go. Beautiful, nice flesh tones, nice color, but for color, that's too much. You know, so I'll bring the A light on. And again, I'm gonna focus on her eyes, good. Nice. Then you can bring everything in. Then we could go, okay, let's see what it looked like with the A light off. I'm sorry, the B light off. And what I love about the speed lights is it gives me this versatility on location. I'm just gonna change the ISO again really quick to brighten the entire scene. Cool. All right, that's really nice. Okay, so let's switch up the lens just for a couple images to get a full length. So Logan, could we lose the chair really quick? Yes, sir. What is the Fresnel lens doing on the eye light that a tighter snook without a lens wouldn't do? The lens itself actually gives a different look and quality of light. It shapes it and actually makes it more round. And there's little ridges in here which spread the light out, but yet still keeps it constrained in the circle. And it's actually like putting a magnifying lens with ridges in there for the light. So you're saying it makes it wide? It spreads out the same well, in a way, yes. So it, it, the actual light molecules, it's actually shaping with those ridges versus just a flat, clean lens in there. 
okay, because those shape the light as it passes through it. This is round, so it's going to make it round. If this was square, then it would make that square. Like a spotlight. Exactly. Yes, exactly. All right. So now, Logan, we're going to bring this right here. And I want you to just kind of give me, um, for lack of a better term, an, a little bit of an awkward pose playing to the corner, right? And then turning toward me, you know, kind of cross your leg, cross one leg out toward me, and looking with your head extreme toward the, toward the light source. There we go. So we can, again, use a full length. Maybe separate your feet a little so we could show the corner, right? There you go. And we could get really creative using the corner. And then one looking right toward me. And again, I use the focus marks right on her face. Good. And then if we like that, so you could kind of almost lean against that corner with the one arm down like you were. Yeah, touch the wall. That's cool. You put your fingers out. No, the other hand. Nice. And looking toward the light, almost with a little bit of a surprised look. There you go. Nice. Right? So it gives you lots of versatility in what you want to do, you know? Cool. Questions, thoughts? Yes. Your light is in the way. Oh, sorry. Good. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. What do you do in uh, post uh, retouching with the background? I know it's a wrinkle. But oh, I like the wrinkles. I do. Yeah, I'd leave it because we want it to look kind of like a wall, you know. So, no, if I didn't want the wrinkles in it, we would stretch it out a little tighter. And then, yeah, again, it's like cooking. How do you want the flavor to be? Me, I like the, I like the look. I even think I would like a couple more wrinkles. And I'm just feeling this in black and white. I like her black sweater. I like the gray, you know. So I would continue, for me, in black and white and photograph this. And let's do one other lighting change just to show the versatility of this is as much as I can. Let's see what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it right here. So again, it's a large light source. We're going all the way up. All right. And now we are going to tilt it. I'm hitting, it, hitting the ceiling. There we go. There we go. Down. All right, we're totally going to change the look and feel of this. All right, Logan, very cool. There it's it. Beautiful. Good. So now we've totally changed the look, right? It's, it's taking away the texture and folds that you were talking about because we've changed the angle of the light and where it's coming from. You know, we could go to really a whole type of Irving Penn look by taking and turning off the hair light. And he would use one large light source like this. So we could actually bring this in right here. And Logan is right there. And just kind of cross your arms, come right, almost center a little bit more. There you go. All right, there you go. Straight at me, beautiful. Uh, both hands outside. And if I could fix your hair. A little bit, there we go. Boom. Really cool, right? Now, let me put that back in TTL. That was in manual, so it, that's why it really got kind of bright. But I kind of like that look on her face, right? We have not blown out the highlights yet because we have not pushed up the right side. So it's still okay, it's just brighter. So I'm in group A, and we're gonna go TTL. And I'm just gonna bring it up plus, um, no, I want to keep it a little moody, so I'll go minus one. So we're going to get richer blacks. Oh, love it. Let's print it. Boom. Print it, right? I like how rich the blacks are. But look at all these different looks we could create. You know, when I used to use traditional strobe, everything in manual, then every time we make an adjustment like this, come in, re-meter, it could slow down momentum. So I love the convenience of speed lights. And in many ways, all of the strobe companies now have graduated to this type of control, right from camera, wirelessly. So whether you're working in manual, TTL, or not. 
let me try one more like that, Logan, and then we'll see if there's any questions on uh, Facebook. I've not done this. So let's bring this in as close as possible. Not get the string in it, right? Because we can't retouch it. And as close to overhead, there we go. I'm going to switch back to the 85 because I want a, more of a portrait look. And it just has a much different feel. And I'm going to photograph it at Aperture 2. And we're going to put this, I have time, right? Yeah. I'm going to put this right there. And again, by having the lights as close as possible, we're diminishing the fall off. And I'm actually going to zoom this head in to 50, because we're even going to tighten up the circle of light. So when you put the mag beam on, now this is really precise. So I've got to line that up, because again, I just want to illuminate her eyes. So I'm going to turn it on. And I'm going to go TTL with that, so I could get there really quickly. And I'm just going to make it minus two. Let's get you kind of in the center of the corner, a little bit more this way. There you go. Great. See, I got misaligned it. Oh, 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 I'm getting an idea. I'm getting an idea. Gumball. Too far. Good. Sorry. I could just do this. There it is. But now a little bit up, a little bit higher. And that's the way, you know, reality works for me is I don't have an assistant. Oh, still short. The closer you are to the subject, too, the more precise this is. But it's about the shape and quality of light. Oh, there we go. Oh, I didn't wait for it to recharge. When you hit the modeling light, you should wait a few seconds. There we go. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. She disappeared. My bad. So you got you to come back, because when you move a little bit, you move out of the light. I think you're, there it is, good. No, nope, again, I, there we go. Cool, that's even kind of cool, right? Okay, I'm just going to swing it, so slightly there, so I don't hit as much of the wall. So we're going to glue your feet down, okay? Yes. <laughs> there we go, cool. All right, one more like that. And then... Oh, again, i got to give it a second to recharge from the modeling light. Normally, I work with battery packs. Now, because we're in so close, you can actually see the flash tube projecting through the lens. Flash tubes are linear. That's the difference between a speed light and a strobe, which is round. See the hot spot and then the shadow shadow, right? It's because we're so close. The further away that light spreads out, and they kind of meld together better. Now we're going to put all the lights on. I'm sorry? You were just comparing the benefits that we just got here of the speed light with what? You can see the actual flash tube. Yeah, no. So it's a linear flash. That's what I was sharing. What, you were, what type of lighting you were comparing it to? Well, so the new Profoto A1. Oh, okay. That's an on-camera studio flash. I wouldn't even call it a speed light. It's round. You wouldn't have that. It would be round. All these things are just ways of conveying and shaping the light. So now we have all the lights on. Angle it. No, do straight. Very nice. Very nice. Now I'm globally going to lower everything with flash exposure compensation because I want my blacks to stay black. Very cool. And I'm just going to now go into each group and get it where I like it. Now, again, we could do it manually. We could do it through TTL. Nice. One more. Beautiful. Just doing same different things with your light. I actually like it without the hair light. A little bit more moody. 
right? But you have options and choices. Do we have any questions from Facebook? Anything? No? All good? Yeah? With the umbrella off to the side, you haven't been using a bounce fill. When would you use a bounce fill? If you had just a smaller umbrella? A smaller light source in relation to the subject. Okay, because mm -hmm. you have a big one, you don't need the bounce fill. Yeah, because it wraps around. And maybe if we had two people, well, now we'd have to be a little bit more careful of what's going on. So I had the second umbrella set up, you know, just to be ready. And we could, you know, we could totally do that. That's easy. And that, that makes for easy peasy lighting, okay? We're going to use this one. Mm -hmm. Take down the ceiling. So we're going to do two lights really. So you'll come up right to the edge. And we're going to flip things around a little bit. Actually, I'm going to do it this way so we don't light too much of the background. We're going to make the A light the fill. And this light is going to be the main. Get the shafts right about equal. Now this is B. And I'm going to move it out so it's more of a large light source. Boom. Cool. All right. We have A and B, correct? And we're just going to start off at zero. They are both equal, and we have no hair light. So, yep, yeah, real strong. There you go. That's beautiful. Nice. They're both TTL. They're both TTL. They're both equal flash output. It looks too bright on the TV, but it's not. See, the highlight on the right is not spiking up. We're not losing information at all. But we can say, OK, I want more moody. So I could take flash exposure compensation down minus 3. Just go big or go home, right? Awesome. There we go. Next, right? Now we could play with, do we want a main? So they're both equal. So now we could create direction. OK, this is basically going to be our fill. We're going to go to the A light, make it minus 3. That's full power. Not full power, but no exposure compensation because we are TTL. And I'm going to go to aperture 4. Right. So if I was in manual mode, I would now have to change my flash output. OK. Really cool, low-key photo. Now, we could say, for printing purposes, that's really too dark. So I go back to flash exposure compensation, which is globally adjusting both of them. I have the ratio set that I like, but now I could adjust flash output for both. Sweet. What a gorgeous light, right? So we could flip-flop. Yes? Oh, there's there, there, there. Yeah. So you're still only using this one as, as a fill? With fill, fill, main. Illumination. Correct. No, it's illuminating. It's firing. So watch. I'll push the preview button. They'll both light up. It's just it's hard to see it with the diffusion, right? But they're not at the same power. They are, they are not. They are not. So the A light is at flash exposure compensation minus 3. The B light is 0, so we could flip it. So we could take A as our main light, B as our fill. We might go a little bit above because the diffusion is actually cutting down flash output. But we don't have to think that way because TTL will compensate. right? So now we just flipped it opposite. So I'll toggle back and forth between the two. That's really pretty. So we really, proper lighting for me is I, I could tell a person's favorite side, usually by the way they part their hair. They open up their face to that side. Statistically, most people, it's about 80, 90%, it's their left side. So this should be your main light coming from the open side, right? So I always light for women at events. So if we go back to the other frame where the camera left light was main, it's not bad, it's just different. This is brighter on her face. And this is Phil. Now if we want to get in a, a wider ratio, we're going to have to go manual. Because we're at 
zero minus three. I can't tell it to go any lower in TTL. But if I want a more dramatic look, I know because I practice, like, okay, let's put B in manual mode, and we'll start off at uh, 64, 164th power. May or may not be there. I don't know. Ah, beautiful, right? Less flash output, very subtle, between the two. Now, if we want even less, we could go to 1 1 28th power. On, make sure I'm doing it right. It's the B group. Yes, B group. And then we'll do just one. So you can actually see the difference. All right, and now we will turn B off. So it's only A. Boom. Right? This is a large surface, too, acting as a reflector as well. So we have options really quick. I like when the fill light on camera left is a little bit brighter because it's putting a beautiful highlight in her hair. So let me switch to color. Go back, everything is normal. Change my, white, uh, my picture style. And I have my favorite picture styles set up. So in a way, it's kind of like having film again. Good, beautiful. Make it just slightly brighter. There we go. Oh, I caught my light. I knew that was gonna happen. Because I want to keep her hands in it. So if I'm catching my light, I'm just gonna slide it. Because I like that composition. And again, eye closest to the camera. Nice. Cool. Thoughts? Questions? Oh, you can't see. Look there. I keep moving my light, I lose my position. Let's see, where am I at? How are we doing on time? Still about 19 minutes. Oh, cool. Quick yes, sir. I'm not criticizing, but no, I sure. want to get a little bit more of a catch light in her right eye. Um, what would you do? Would you put a reflector on red or something? Okay. No, well, um, what if you want to there is a catch light there. It's there. Here, let me share with you. So we'll close. One second. I just don't think the TV is rendering it. Mm -hmm. Get the zoom. Come on. Or you can take the diffusion off, and we're going to get more of a catch light here in her eye. So if you want more specularity, I think is what you're asking for. I don't know this term, specularity. Specularity just means re re bright, highlight, reflective. Okay. The term diffusion, I believe, is overused. So either the highlights are specular, bright, silver, um, or they're softer. Like that's more of a diffused, you could say softer, but it's more actually you're diffusing the light. And then we could just ramp this in a little bit closer. And that's the beauty of the deep umbrella. And let's just throw a color gel on it. All right. I'm going to change my white balance. I'm going to go down to tungsten. A light is the main light. There we go. And turn your hips just a little this way. Your hips too. There you go. Or no, go back and then just turn your chin. There you go. Nice. And close your fingers. Your hip. Nice. Just a little bit. There we go. Cool. 
So this will actually put a little bit more specularity. Oh, wrong program, sorry. There we go. So we have a little bit more specularity in the eye because this is silver. So it'll add it in. Um, they make a great tool. Wes got um, the eye lighter, and it goes down here. And that puts a beautiful, and it, depending on how you angle it, you don't have to have that half moon catch light in the eye. You could run it this way and bounce into it. You could get really creative with it, you know, or put a small reflector. Could you, could you, what methodology could you use to have catch light, that specularity, in both eyes? Because this side is more in shadow and it's nicely mm -hmm. defining our face. Sure. Very nice. I like the now you're talking style. Shots, but what about getting catch light? Yeah, if you want more catch light in that eye, whatever you want to do, you can just change your light or change your angle. You know, and you could turn again a little bit since that's your favorite side of your face. There you go. Good. You know, and you could bring depending on how she is. So if she's looking a little bit away from the light, we're putting that eye more in shadow. Now, if you turn straight toward me. Now we're going to get light in both eyes. One second here. Now we're getting catch lights in both eyes. It all depends. The eye is like a window that reflects light. So it's all what you do. Now both eyes have a catch light. So it all depends on the style and technique and look you're trying to achieve. And here, you notice we now have gray, and we have a blue cast because this is daylight. Thank you, Logan. I'll just go through for photos. This is daylight balanced. That was tungsten balanced with a tungsten gel, and I was shooting for the flesh tone in tungsten white balance on Kelvin, so 3,200 degrees Kelvin. So you have tons of options and choices and things that you could do on location. Everything for me, is on location. Oh, let's, I have, I have a few more minutes. Let me try one thing creative. OK, cool. I'm going to try this. All right, Logan, I'm going to bring you back. So this is just going to be now a fill. All right. And we're going to bring this in. And I'm going to bring it up a little bit. And you can come further out, like right to the edge. I don't. Because I actually move faster than an assistant. Because I already know in my mind what I want to do. I have a second shooter, or a third shooter, things of that nature. And we go from there. All right, Let's see if I could do this one handed. Get Logan in focus. It's just to get an effect, right? The closer, oh, why did I lose contact? I must have bumped the wire. Just restart it, unless my, I don't think my battery's dead. Never know though, it could be. This cam ranger is connected, good. Check my wires, make sure I didn't bonk it. That's why I'm bad with a hard wire tether. There we go, it's coming in. All right. Do you shoot tethered for weddings? No. Once in a while for bar mitzvahs I shoot tethered because they want to see the image appear live on a screen. Ah. So I'll do that. Is, is camera in light? 
I'm sorry? Is that the best? Or wait, wait, one question at a time. Sorry. Uh, my question was, the, is, is the program faster than the light loop? Software? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you could have a watch folder and use anything you want to do it. But we're in an extreme environment here, and usually there's no problem with it, you know? It is not. So Cam Ranger is this device, which is creating a point-to-point -point network between your computer and the camera wirelessly. Canon makes their own version of this, which is fine, but you almost need to be an IT professional to get them synced up. You know, in the Cam Ranger, I can use on all of my cameras. Let me just turn this on and off really quick. So Cam Ranger will work on my 5D Mark IV, my 1DX, you know, my 1DX Mark II. It'll work on all of my cameras instead of having to buy one for every camera, which I used to do. All right, boot this up. So again, a lot of times when I'm doing location portraits, engagement sessions, anything, you look for something that could bring a little bit of a creative edge to it. A lot of detail shots, things like that. I'll use the little twinkle lights, you shoot through, and it just gives Buka either in the background or the foreground, and it just becomes a framing, a framing element. Camera's on. Let's see where I'm at here. Log in. Cool. There we go. Connection. All right. Yeah, it's it's just fun to do. Have it in there. It might be easier horizontally. Good. There we go. And you could have, you know, it's a framing device in, out of the frame, close to the lens. You could play with the design. Right? And then they start getting this cool buka effect in your field of view. So it's just a fun little, fun little thing. All kinds of fun stuff. All right. Now let me do a recap. Thank you. Let's do a recap quickly. I'll put this out of the way. Good. So right tool for the right job. Pick your tools that you want to take on location and make it work, right? I love using the corner. I got a big corporate gig coming up where I'm going to be doing 100 people in three days, headshots. So I'll have this, and then I'll do an environment. They want two setups. I'm going to use speed lights because I only have two pro photo heads. So I could do a main light, a hair light, and a fill light for here with speed lights. I have 10 speed lights. Then for the environment, they're going to walk from here, and they're going to go here to step out into the environment, and I'll just do a two-light set up there, a main and a fill. You know, this one's going to have big umbrellas. The other one's just going to have two rapid boxes. So boom, boom, you know, and then I'll switch between channels. So these will be channel 15. Those will be channel 14. So I could totally do this rapidly on my own. Yes? Do you use continuous lighting? Do I use continuous lighting? You came in late. No, no, I, I rarely, I do use continuous lighting once in a while, but not too often because it's limited in your use depending on the amount of ambient light in the environment. So if you're having to photograph in a hotel atrium with a lot of sunlight coming in, you can't overpower it with continuous light. So flash works great for that. And speed lights work great for me because I could take more with me. Between this bag and my small think tank rolling bag, I could fit all 10 speed lights, all my grids, everything I need to do the job. And then I also use external battery packs, 
high voltage external battery, battery pack, the bolt packs that they have here, so rarely do I wait for it to recycle after I've used the modeling light or wait for the next shot. What if you're in the really dark If I'm in a really dark environment, yeah. I'll use an on-camera flash just for the focus of cisbeam. That way I don't need any bright lights on in the, in the space that I'm in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. And yes? For the, the umbrella, with the big, big umbrella, sometimes you need them more than once in life. You can. So that's why I have this thing called a triple threat. So it depends on how, so sometimes when I travel, especially to overseas, when weight starts coming into an issue for shipping, I will use only speed lights instead of carrying two Profoto B1 heads because it starts adding up weight. And I'll use three in each umbrella with two battery packs on here. And then I get very efficient use. So I'd have six in each one and it's very efficient. And then I can move on and do more things. For portraits and yeah. Yeah, you saw I've been playing between 100 and 400 ISO. You know, if you wanted to shoot faster without a battery pack, then go to a higher ISO. So that's the reason I start off by saying I use ISO first, because that determines how sensitive the camera is to light. So if we want a faster recycle time out of these guys, raise the ISO. The cameras today are so amazing. Geez, I hate to say 800 is the new norm. It could be 1250 with the 5D Mark IV, 2500 all day long, no problem. No problem at all. You know, and you get increased recycle time and a larger aperture, meaning let's say you want to photograph at F8, F11 without a battery pack or with. You could go there. Uh, a lot of people said that the big umbrella speed light's not enough. It is. Well, that's why if I'm just using a single speed light, that's why I have a silver and I have a white. A single speed light in the silver, this is highly reflective, makes maximum use out of a small light. You got a question? What kind of battery pack do you use that's reliable for that, that low of a day? Mm -hmm. I use the Bolt battery pack that they have here. They have two, the one that has two outlets on it. Okay. And the reason being is if you really want fast recycle time, they make a two into one cable. And that gives you like about one second of this? Uh, it'll recycle it at full power in a second or less, but you gotta be careful because you'll overheat them. If you go too fast, too, no, oh, sure. Nikons, they'll knock out. At least Canons, they'll turn red and start getting mad at you before they shut off. Mm. Yeah, yes. What's the diameter of that umbrella? 53 inches, right, Dave? These are 53? 53. And what's the other one, a 40? Two sizes. 53 and a what? 53 and 43. 53 and 43. I choose the bigger because I'm, like I said, I want this tool to do multiple things. So if I want to light a full length or if I want to light a large group, I want a bigger light. It's pretty much going to take up the same space in this bag. So I'd rather have more options instead of less. Now, again, if I start shrinking in space to a smaller bag, my other you know, favorite kit is something called a perfect pair where it's a shoot through umbrella and a medium softbox. Now they're designed specifically, more specifically for speed lights. They're smaller, it's a 43 inch umbrella. And what's the Apollo medium? Uh, 20 inch, 20 inch square. square. Halo, which is 43 inch. Yeah, 43 inch. So and the Halo is really, back. it's the most underappreciated, unsexy light modifier. But if I had to grab one and run out the door, it would be that. Because it's an umbrella that's enclosed. So you could actually photograph through the umbrella as a shoot through, but the backing on it is silver. So it maximizes any light that's reflected off the surface bouncing back. Or you could turn the speed light this way for more diffused or softer light into the halo and projecting back out. So it's really a non-sexy but very useful tool. Mm -hmm. I love the simplicity of everything being able to set up off of one shaft. I don't have to carry speed rings or extra parts. So it just makes setup and tear down a snap. Yes, sir? Uh, when you shoot groups, do you always uh, edge light? When I shoot groups, do I always edge light? Yeah. I do. Okay. Yeah, because it makes a huge difference in a dark environment. 
you know, the people against a dark background, heavy wood paneling, they're wearing dark clothing. It's that little difference that my client doesn't know why they like my work better than the next guy. Yeah, it gives a nice separation. Every TV show, every movie you look at, there is a separation light. They're doing something to separate the subject. Chicago Med, you know, they do great lighting on that show. Every woman has a hair light. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't lose I'm sorry? Floor lights wouldn't use floor, floor lights? Floor yeah. The floor lights in the environment? Yeah. What's a floor light? Well, you know, the lights on the floor, it's kind of like, you know, projecting up. Lights on the floor projecting up? Yeah. No, I would not. No, I don't like the, I don't care for the look. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minute warning. All right, let me, let me put that graphic back up here really quickly. If you want to learn more, you could go to our website, and it's bobanddawndavis.com, and there's links there for photographers, links there to see our work. If you want a guide to go through cross-color, different portrait lighting techniques, lighting diagrams, settings, all that, text Shutterfest PDF to that phone number, and you'll get an email with a link to the download. But other than that, what's that? Yes, fjwestcott.com. And thank you, B&H. And thank you, Westcott, for bringing me here. And I, I love to share. So if you guys can reach me, if you want an email, you want to message me on Facebook, I'm happy to answer your questions.